All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Say hello to everybody that's here, nice and loud. And hello to you that are joining us from home. We have a good, rowdy crowd tonight, so it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. I am Pastor Chris. This is Crossover Church of God in Old Town Clovis, and we are in the book of Romans, starting at chapter 11 tonight. If you're reading from your own Bible uh, at home, go ahead and turn to chapter 11. So up to this point, we saw in chapter 10 some highlights. I'm not going to have it on the screen for you or in the notes, but some highlights were chapter 10 was Paul spent some time uh, lamenting the condition of the Israelites, if you recall. Um, he had a great zeal for them and great zeal for their heritage and tradition, just like they did. But he noted that they had no real knowledge of the heart of God. And that's a, there's a big difference. I was talking to somebody just today about the importance of relationship, right? It's all about relationship. It's not about rules. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Paul also laid um, laid out how God's great plan of blessing, but noted that it requires that we choose to obey. So there's our part and there's God's part. And so tonight we're going to continue um, on the thoughts of chapter 10 as he, as he kind of rolls into chapter 11. And and remember, at times, it's helpful to remember that when these scripts were originally, these manuscripts were originally written, it was a letter. This was literally a letter to the Roman church. So there, there were no chapter breaks. There were no verse breaks. Paul didn't say, refer back to chapter 10, where I said so-and-so. He is a, It was a letter. So what we're reading tonight is literally just a continuation of where we left, left off last week. So let me go ahead and pray, and then I'm going to have our brother Jim read the text tonight, which is verses 1 through 10 of chapter 11. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the fact that you invite us into that relationship, the relationship with you, Lord, that the God of all creation wants to have a relationship with me. What a concept. You don't need me, but you want me. I don't, I don't get that, but it's true. We thank you for that, Lord. It's all about your desire to, to be with us, to, to fellowship with us, Lord, to teach us, to show us, God, a way that is better and to love us right where we are and yet at the same time draw us out for more that you have for us. You are amazing, Lord, and we thank you for that. As we study your word tonight, let it become... Rhema, Lord, that living word, uh, instead of just this written word that if we're not careful, we just look down at the pages and see words and, and we read it and go away, not even remembering what we read. God, I pray that it would sink in right now, Lord, literally just let it cause, cause it to just take root in our hearts tonight and change us, Lord. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, brother, Romans 11, 1 through 10. Romans 11, the remnant of Israel. I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they're trying to kill me? And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed to the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. All right. Thank you, Jim. So with everything that uh, Paul said in chapter 10, if you recall about the stubbornness of Israel, um, uh, now he presents a rhetorical question, and he asks in verse 1, as Jim just read, 
Did God reject his people? So that's a, that's a question, but then he really kind of goes on and answers the question by introducing, again, the concept of a faithful remnant. Aren't you glad that God uses remnants? We, so we know that God rejected many, if not most, of the people because of their stubbornness and hard-headedness and rebellion, but he didn't reject the whole lot of them, did he? There was a faithful, there was a faithful remnant, there were a faithful few, and Paul is stating that he is one of them. Aren't, are you one of them? <laughs> I, I'm glad I want to, I'm one of them. As I was preparing this study, I, I was thinking that and praying that, Lord, I'm glad I'm part of that faithful remnant. And as soon as I said that, I, was, I challenged myself, stay faithful, stay faithful, <laughs> stay faithful. Be that, be part of that faithful remnant. Be part. Did you know that Jesus is coming for a spotless and a, and, and a church without blemish? He is coming. We, we're not there yet, guys. We are not ready, but we know that the signs, when we look at what's going on in the world, we know that the earth is shaking and groaning and there's earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and all that is going on in our world. We know that the time is getting short, but God is allowing what? His church time to prepare and be that spotless bride that he wants to come back for. I want to be part of that. Oh, that my name would be on that roll. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen? So, Back in Romans 9, uh, by the way, uh, just a little refresher uh, from Romans 9, Paul uh, reminded us of the words of Isaiah when he was talking about a remnant. In, Isaiah, in Romans 9, 27, it says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. So Paul is reminding us of the prophet Isaiah that spoke that. Uh, and by the way, that is very challenging and scary at the same time, isn't it? Only the remnant will be saved. But it's also, I believe, encouraging for us today, right? Because again, I want to say, God works through remnants. <laughs> Are we going to get that? And God has been just ordained it to where I've had the opportunity to speak that phrase on more than one occasion lately, I think God is reminding us that, that he does indeed work through remnants. Okay, what does a remnant mean? Are we talking about a carpet sample? <laughs> carpet remnant? No. But that's what remnant means, right? A remnant is literally a small remaining portion. But in a biblical sense, it's got even a deeper meaning because it represents a remaining group of faithful ones who were once part of a much, much larger group. Key words, faithful ones, remaining group of faithful ones, even though small, it's still a faithful group. Well, what happened to the rest of the group, Pastor? Well, indeed, what did happen? I don't know. I can't answer for them. I'll only answer for myself, right? I can't answer. I can't answer for churches that are watering down the gospel to not offend. I can't answer for what I hear about going on nationwide where, where, where we are more concerned about... Um, about uh, uh, appearing relevant culturally than we are biblically relevant. I mean, heaven forbid. I, you know, that's not going to fly on the day of judgment. I don't know about how you feel about that, but on, on the day of judgment, I don't want to be standing there trying to sell God on this idea about, well, it was important to be culturally relevant. I didn't want to offend anybody with this whole Jesus is the only way thing, you know? I mean, these days, it's all about pluralism, right? You have your idea about what it takes. I have my idea about spirituality. I don't want to step on your toes. Have you ever noticed that the world we live in now, nobody uh, wants to offend anybody except, apparently, God? Apparently, it's okay to offend God. Well, I don't want to offend God. Well, you're offending what he says in his word. His word is his word. His word, not my word. It's his thoughts. The word of God is, is a collection of, the Bible, the word Bible literally means a collection of books written by what? Inspired by the Holy Spirit so that we can know the heart of God, Old Testament, New Testament. It's God's love letter to us. It is his thoughts. It's his word. And in his word, he says these things that describe his ways and his attributes and his character. And yet we can throw that aside and say, well, that's not exactly culturally relevant now, so we will marginalize that. 
Maybe we'll add just a few of those little things in that don't offend anybody. Well, again, I want to be far, part of that uh, small remnant that is staying true to what his word says. So here's a takeaway for us today when we are talking about remnants. Don't give up. Amen. Don't give up. God chooses to be moved by a faithful few. Did you know that? God chooses. It's his volition. He does it by his own volition. He chooses to be moved by a faithful few. So Paul goes on with this being said, and he asks, and he says, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. In another place, he calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what Scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God about Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now God's putting a number on this particular group, this small group of faithful ones. It's 7,000 in this case. But see, now, notice, Paul had previously talked about what Isaiah said about this notion of a remnant, a faithful remnant. Now he's tying in another prophet, isn't he? The prophet Elijah. He's bringing him into discussion. And by the way, he's talking about the scene, the awesome scene, in 1 Kings, right? 1 Kings 18 is where it starts. What happens in 1 Kings 18? <laughs> One of my favorite stories in the Bible. The prophets of Baal, right? Hundreds of prophets of Baal, all full of their stuff and walking around proudly and defying God and saying that they, they don't need this God of Israel because they had the goods themselves. And so we see a showdown, as it were, right? And, and he even taunts. I love that. That... That's a, that's a story where there's some humor interjected. I love how, how uh, Elijah kind of taunts him a little bit. Hey, 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 try harder. Maybe your God's asleep. <laughs> Maybe he's taking a nap, right? Yeah, yeah, because the whole idea was, hey, you put, your, you put your sacrifice on the altar and let your God come down and consume it, and then I'll, I'll do my thing. And, and so we know the story. It's, a, it's an awesome story. I encourage you to go back and read 1 Kings 18. Great victory. God was shown glorious. The, their altar was soaked with water, and still the fire of heaven came down and consumed the whole altar, water at all. It consumed it all. God was glorified. Elijah was vindicated. What an awesome scene that is. One of the most victorious scenes in the Bible, really. And the prophets were all, the false prophets were all killed. And now let's pick up the story, by the way, because Paul, this is what Paul is referencing here. And, and it's a little lengthy, but let's, it's, it's good context. I think it's good to take a look at this story. Let's pick up the story now in chapter 19 of 1 uh, Kings, um, because this is what happens right after the victorious scene at the altar there with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger, a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. In other words, this is a direct threat. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat underneath it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid, lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, 
get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. So he's answering the same way. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Anoint, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shephat, from Abel, uh, whatever that is, to succeed you as a prophet. Uh, Jehu will be put, will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose Mouths have not kissed him. Okay, so that was a long read there. But that's the full story of what happened to Elijah in this scene being described by Paul in tonight's text. And we're going to get back to Paul's point in a minute, but, but there's a few things I want to point out about this story in Elijah because it's such a powerful story, and it, and it ties in with what we're talking about tonight. The first thing I want to, I want to point out is I want you to notice what Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, said, by the way, Ahab was the king of what? Israel. And he was an evil king. <laughs> he was one of those, you know, how in, in, the, in, in the Old Testament it talks about the kings, and he did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any other king before him. And then there was a good king, and then there was another bad king. And, well, he was one of the real bad ones. He was also the one that I was describing recently when I was talking about the uh, the uh, armor of God and the breastplate of righteousness. And I talked about how they made those breastplates back in the day. They were like scales. And so that they would protect, um, the way the scales laid, they would protect from penetrations. And the only way that you could penetrate was to get at, at a weird angle and get underneath the scale, one of the scales with an arrow. And that's exactly what happened to him. That was his demise. He got his uh, his breastplate, as it were, was, was pierced. It was compromised. Well, he, he had a life of compromise far before that, even by marrying a, 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 this Jezebel to begin with. And then now he's being swayed. And now look what it says. Look what the wife of, of uh, Ahab says. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. So here's this compromised king, Ahab. He's got this influential, evil, pagan wife named Jezebel spouting threats, right? <laughs> idle threats, right? These must be, surely there are idle threats. I mean, Elisha, Elijah had just had a great victory God was honored, like I said, right? So everything's just great, right? Elijah must have heard these idle threats and scoffed, right? I mean, because his confidence was at an all-time high, right? <laughs> it's just like I feel when I preach a great sermon and there's a great altar call. Man, I walk out here, nothing's going to sway me. 
shoot, within 10 minutes of leaving this church, I can guarantee you I am tried. The enemy comes at us. Those arrows come in. They try to get themselves wedged underneath our breastplate. See, that compromise is what took Ahab down, and, and, and the compromise is what the enemy tries to get us with. And that's exactly, I'm sorry, but that's exactly what we see here. Elijah, look at what, look how Elijah responded. He was afraid and ran for his life. Are you kidding me? When he came down to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came, into a, came to a broom bush, broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Wow. Isn't it comforting to know that you're not the only one capable of going from a spiritual high to a spiritual low in just a matter of minutes? <laughs> I mean, that's the first thing I thought of, man. What a bozo. And then I thought, hmm, how many times have I, has that happened to me? Man, whew, way up here and then whew, way down here. Now, I like to think that I'm not running for my life asking God to take me out. But, you know, I don't know. I can't say I haven't been close. But, I mean, Elijah, man, come on, man. You're, you're, a, you're a prophet. You're one of the prophets in the Bible, man. But as we're chuckling about Elijah, I want to point out something because, like, like, again, like I said, let's go back and get a few nuggets of this story before we move back to Romans 11. Uh, if we're not careful, as we're chuckling and, over, and, and thinking about Elijah, we might miss what? We might miss the grace of God in this story. There's grace intermingled with so many of these stories that we know of in the Old Testament. So let's look at it. First of all, I want to point out that God didn't condemn Elijah for his fear. Have you ever thought about it that way? God didn't condemn Elijah for his fear. I mean, when you look at this weakness that Elijah showed, running for his life, wanting to die, I mean, that's kind of dramatic, isn't it? I mean, come on, you know, a little drama. I mean, he just had this high, man. You would be so easy to think that God would have been angry with him and at least scolded him, right? Instead, God sent an angel to attend to him. Did you get that? To give him food and water. Isn't that amazing? There's grace in these stories. Psalm 103, one of my favorite psalms says, the Lord is compassionate and what? Gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse. Did you know that? Nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 57 puts it this way. God says, I will not accuse them forever, nor will I always be angry. For then they would faint away because of me, the very people I have created. Did you know that's in the Bible? God knows that if he was always angry at us, if he was always finding fault with us, that we would faint, right? We, 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 we wouldn't be able to stand up to that. I don't know about you, but I've been, after a while, I already kind of struggle with that anyway, of seeing myself as kind of a knucklehead an inch away, right? I mean, that's what our flesh is. That's what our shame says all the time. And then here's an angry God. Are you kidding? I can't stand up to that. But God's not an angry God, is he? He's compassionate and he's gracious and he's slow to anger and abounding in love, isn't he? Praise God for that. So, so again, I just say, that there's grace intermingled with these in this story here. And the next point I want to make, and this is awesome, is that God remedied Elijah's feelings of failure by what? Giving him his next assignment. <laughs> Did you notice that? He, here's Elijah whining and complaining, wanting to die, all this stuff. God doesn't even go there. Did you notice he doesn't even respond to that? Reminded me of when the prodigal son in the story came uh, the father comes running down the dirt road and the prodigal son presents his speech that he surely has been rehearsing for days probably on the way home. Before he could even get five words out, though, his father threw the robe around him and said, let's rejoice and celebrate my son is home. See, he didn't even respond to the weakness and to the excuses and to the whining uh, 
that, that Elijah was doing there um, because he had a plan for him to carry it out. And he still had that plan, amen? So check this out, this next point out. God graciously showed Elijah, guess what? He was still on the team, <laughs> right? I don't know if you saw that in the story. He, he showed Elijah that he was still on the team. Here's Elijah, this great prophet, just had this great victory. Now he wants to die. He's, he just wants to run and hide. He's calling, oh, just take me out, Lord. I'm done. I'm no better than anybody else. I, it's, I'm completely ineffective. I'm a horrible leader. Nobody's listening to me. And now they want to kill me too. And God doesn't even go there. Instead, he reminds him that he's still on the team. So God met Elijah at his struggle. He lovingly ministered to him in his need and strengthened him for the work that he had for you, for him. So somebody just needs to hear me say this to you tonight, that God is not done with you. Amen? God is not done with you. He's not done with me. Praise God for that. He wants to meet you at your place of despair. He wants to meet you at your feelings of loss and failure. And he wants to minister healing to you because, first of all, he loves you. And second, because he still has a work for you. Praise God. But get this, as we saw, before God, before he sends you to your next task, God wants to have an encounter with you. <laughs> That's another thing I want to point out that, about that story. I mean, look at the scene. God sends Elijah on a 40-day journey to a mountain, and when he gets there, what does he do? He hides in a cave, <laughs> right? God met him there and said, hey, what are you doing in this cave? I didn't send you to here to hide. Come out to the mountain. I want you to experience my presence. You're going to need this in order to walk in the power and the authority that I have called you to. Amen. <laughs> See, we have ways of hiding, don't we? Don't we have ways of hiding? You better believe we have ways of hiding. We can, we can be in a crowded room and still be hiding. We climb inside our heads. We, we, we hide behind victim mentality. We hide behind despair and loss of hope and and discouragement and all of that. We're hiding, and God says, hey, I didn't send you this far. I didn't do this work in you. I didn't rescue you from your alcoholism. I didn't save your marriage. I didn't set your feet back on solid ground. I didn't save you so you could be here hiding. <laughs> Amen? I still have a work for you to do. So what we see here in this scene Again, God's saying, come out to this mountain. I want to have an encounter with you. He hid in the cave. So again, I say, what cave have you been hiding in? I just say, I believe the Spirit's here tonight saying it's time to come out of that cave and stand on the mountain. <laughs> come out of that cave and stand on the mountain, I said. Reminds me of one of my favorite psalms. Psalm 24, I don't talk enough about that. It's the psalm that we sing a lot. Who is this king of glory? Lift up your heads, be lifted up. Lift up your gates, be lifted up. But in that psalm, it also says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will be part of it. See, that's a generation. I want to be part of that generation. And it says, such is the generation of those who seek his face, who seek you, O God of Jacob. Let me be part of that number, God. Let me be part of that faithful uh, remnant, Lord, that I could ascend to the mountain, Lord, clean my heart, Clean my hands, Lord. Clean me, Father, so that I can stand in your presence, Lord, because I know you are preparing me for a bigger work that I need to do, God. And you're calling me out of the cave, Lord, so I could stand in your presence and get ready for that calling, Lord. And when Elijah stood on the mountain, he was tested to learn to hear the voice of God. A great and powerful wind tore through the mountains, and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind, was he? After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, that still small voice. Amen. 
I want to tell somebody tonight that God had a great calling on Elijah's life, and he wanted Elijah to learn how to hear his voice. (laughs) And it is no different for me, and it is no different for you. God has a calling on your life, and so he wants you, he needs you, he commands you to learn how to hear his voice over all the other noise. We spent last two Sundays talking about that very subject of discernment, learning how to separate. That's what the word discern means. It means to separate. Separate what? The lies from the truth. Separate the, the, the word of, the, of, the, of our flesh, the words of our accuser, the words of our past, of shame, and all these other things. Separate that from the words of God because God is calling you to the mountain. He's not sending you into a cave, guys. Amen? It's imperative that we learn how to listen and hear the voice of God to separate it from the noise. And notice, even when he heard God's still small voice, what, how did he react? He went back to his hiding place and felt sorry for himself. Did you notice that? <laughs> he, did the, he repeated the whole scene all over again. Even after hearing that still small voice, how many times have we gotten an epiphany? We've, we feel like we've heard from the Lord. Hey, I, I, I'm praying about this, and I felt like I had a great breakthrough. We have a little mountaintop experience, and if we're not careful, if we don't continue to stay filled with the Spirit, even after that, we are leaving ourselves susceptible to going right back into the cave. I'm learning, man. I'm learning that in my own life. I love those mountaintop experiences, man, when God calls me out to that mountain and I have a one-on-one with him and he breathes into me the very words of life that I needed to hear. And I have a way, though, of walking down and going, oh, I got a word from the Lord, man. I got a word from the Lord. That's going to carry me two or three weeks. Good, easily, right? No, I need another word in about half an hour. (laughs) You know what? Because the enemy comes in like a flood. He comes in to steal that seed that was planted. He is the accuser of the brethren. He is out to kill, steal, and destroy. So that means I got to be filled with the Spirit, and I got to stay filled with the Spirit. It is a present imperative. Uh, That's the kind of verb that it is when Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. It means be continually filled with the Spirit, like a sail of a boat needs to be filled with air continually to glide across the water. I don't want to go back into a hiding place and feel sorry for myself. How about you? We will never be able to hear God's voice with a victim mentality. Hello. We will never be able to hear God's voice with a victim mentality. Yikes. Is that true? But again, getting back to God's patience and his grace. Oh, thank God for that. God was indeed patient. He asked him again, what are you doing here? I still have a great work for you, Elijah. I'm not done with these people that you think aren't listening to you. (laughs) Some are listening to you. I'll tell you, honestly, that's a word for me right now. If nobody else gets anything from that, I want you to know my spirit was built up this week when I prepared to study. It was exactly the words I needed to hear. I still have a great work for you. I'm not done with these people that you think aren't listening to you. Some are listening to you, a small faithful remnant, and I will save that remnant, and I will show my glory through them. Oh, how I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in. How about you? You want to be in that small number? You want to to go down that narrow gate? Or you want to be in the wide gate, the one that leads to death and destruction? There's a gate that is wide and it is easily slid down. It's it's Teflon. It's it's all smooth and nice and pretty and, and, and enticing. And that way leads to destruction. But there's this narrow gate. This narrow gate that's hard to go through, and at times it really challenges us to the core of who we are. But it's through that narrow gate that we find the way of truth and life and joy and, hap- and, and, and fulfillment on this, on, this, uh, on this side of heaven and eternal life on that side of heaven. Amen? I don't want to be in that number. I want to be part of that small remnant. 
And then what, we're, what we see here is Paul's tying all this back in. And he's saying what was originally meant to be a blessing for all the people ended up being a blessing for only a faithful few. Right? So I asked a minute ago, well, what happened to the others? Well, let's find out. We're going to close with this. This is what we read in the text. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not attain, obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. You remember a few weeks ago we talked about that idea of hardening. Hardened. And we said that, among other things, among other ways to describe it, it's, a, it's basically God giving us over to what we stubbornly keep wanting to go back to. Yikes. Yikes. God, don't give me over to this. No wonder David said in Psalm 51, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Oh, God. Lord, that it would stink, that it would always stink when I sin and create a chasm between me and you, Lord. May it always hurt. May it always not go well with me, Lord. I don't want sin to ever sit well with me because I know when it does, that's dangerous. I'm getting hardened. I don't want to be callous, Lord. And that's what they were. Some were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of what? Stupor. <laughs> you know, they're, you know they're, just, they're just not getting it, man. They're just, you know, that's the person that walks up to a mirror and walks away and forgets what he just saw, right? Stupor. I mean, that means that literally just like all the cylinders aren't firing, you know? <laughs> We're not firing on cylinders here, you know. We're not, we're not, we're not getting it. We're, we're, we're mixed up. We're confused. Our minds are, 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 uh, are, 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 are literally clouded by the enemy, by the sin, by this thing that is, hardened, that is hardening us. The spirit of stupor, eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot, could not hear to this very day. Yikes. And then he ties in David, one of the Psalms. May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Yikes. <laughs> That's all I say is that that is yikes. That's these people. You know, we're not talking about random people out there in the world, this is the larger part of God's chosen people that chose rebellion. Amen? You get what I'm saying? This is their lot. <laughs> this is what they get. You want this so badly? God said, here you go. In, in, in Isaiah 30, it reminds me of one of my Psalms that, or my Isaiah uh, scriptures that I quote a lot. In repentance, arrest is your salvation, and quietness and trust is your strength. The very next words, but you would have none of it. So therefore, your pursuers will be swift. You're, you're, you're going to just spend your whole day running, in other words. You're going to be like a flagstaff on the, on, the, on the hilltop. In other words, it's just going to be you. Where did everybody else go? They all abandoned you. Everybody's running. Well, that's what you wanted. You got it. You want to go back to Israel or to uh, Egypt for your military might, for the three squares a day and all of that? The very thing that I just rescued you from, you're in your grumbling, in your rebellion in the desert. You said, hey, we were better off back there. How dare you? If that's what you really want, then go get it. Here you go. Have your pagan traditions, the very things that I told you not to do. You wanted them so badly. There you go. In Romans 1, Paul says, and God gave them over to these things. God gave them over. Yikes, it should scare us to the, to the bone, guys. God, don't give me over to these things that I stubbornly hold on to. Instead, God, take them from me, Lord. Take them from me, God. I, I freely give them to you. 
Give me those clean hands and a pure heart, Lord, that I could ascend the hill of the Lord, that I could stand in your holy presence, that I could be part of this generation, Lord, that seeks your face, O God of Jacob. I want to be part of that generation. How about you guys? This, this part of the chapter tonight was about that faithful remnant. You get what I'm saying? I love how God answered Elijah with such grace. He said, hey, you know, I know you're running. You don't think people are listening, but 7,000, 7,000 are listening, and I'm going to save them, and I'm going to show my glory through them. I tell you guys, as your pastor, I want you to know if 10 people are listening, if five people are listening, if one person is listening, I'm still going to do it because I have his, him to answer to. Amen? Because I want to be part of that faithful few. And I believe that God indeed works through remnants. He's not hung up on numbers like we are. He can, he can, when, he's, when it's go time, this place is going to fill up, and we're going to have a problem of how we're going to seed everybody. But it's all going to be his timing it's not going to be because I'm trying to drum up numbers and attendance and all that. It's just going to be because a church took this serious, this whole idea of being part of the faithful few, and it moved the heart of God. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Thank you, God, for the challenge. Thank you for the encouragement and the grace intermingled in. Thank you, Lord, that you are the same today as you were thousands of years ago in this story of Elijah. You never change. Ah, we're the ones that change. We're all over the place, but you don't. We're so thankful for that, God. I pray, Lord, that as this church, Crossover Church of God, in 2022, as we humble ourselves, as we turn from our wicked ways, as we seek your face, Lord, I pray that we would indeed be found by you. And then, Lord, you can lead us back into the place that from which you led us into exile to begin with, Lord. Some of us feel exiled. Some of us feel all alone, Lord. Some of us feel tired, weary. Lord, I pray that you would begin to restore the years the locusts have eaten. And lives, Lord, as we, as we continue to press into you, Lord, during the season that we're in here at this church, talking about on Sunday morning, Lord, the season of healing, Lord. I pray, God, that you would begin to do mighty and powerful works in this place. Work through a faithful remnant, Lord God. Let your glory be seen in this place, Lord God. I pray for marriages to be restored. I pray, God, for lives to be restored. I pray for addictions to be laid down. I pray, God, for, for uh, ministries to be launched, Lord. I pray, God, for dreams to be hatched and, and birthed, Lord, in this place, Father, do a mighty work, Father. We pray for signs and wonders at 434 Fifth Street. We want to be part of that small remnant, Lord, that you will use and work from. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Hope you got something from tonight. Bless you. Bless you guys watching from home. We'll see you soon.